Hello and welcome to the lecture on equity related transactions. In that area we'll talk about issuing stock, both common and preferred stock. We'll talk about dividend related transactions, both cash dividends and stock dividends. And then finally we'll talk about treasury stock related transactions. I'll follow that with some information that will help you with the account attribute project. I'll talk about classified financial statements and then briefly about temporary and permanent accounts. So the first one, stock issuance. Remember when companies issue stock, it depends on their state laws. They could issue stock with a par value or they could issue stock with no par value. Some states have stated value, which is equivalent to par value. So when we do these entries, remember that we're receiving either cash or assets. We're increasing common stock and we use the par value for that side of the entry. And then if there is a par value, we'll have uh, paid in capital in excess of par. So please pause this video for a minute and record these three transactions on your journal entry paper. And then we'll resume with the entries. Okay. In the first entry, we issue 10,000 shares of $10 par preferred stock at $14 per share. So we receive $140,000 in cash. We credit preferred stock for the par value of those shares. So 10,000 shares at $10 or 100,000. And the difference goes to paid in capital and excess preferred stock. And we track that separately from paid in capital and excess common stock. The second transaction, there is no par value associated with it. So there is no such thing as paid in capital in excess. So in this case, when we issue 5,000 shares at $21 per share, we receive $105,000 in cash and we increase common stock by that amount. In the last transaction, we issue 15,000 shares of $10 par common stock for land that has a market value of $180,000. So we can determine how we're going to record this entry in, in the real world, either if the asset we receive has a firm uh, value, a market value that's easily determinable, or if it doesn't, if the stock that's being given has a fair market value, for example, if it's traded or if there's been recent transactions. In this case, the land has a fair market value, so we debit land for that amount, which means we credit common stock for the par value of the 15,000 $15, shares at $10, and the remainder goes to paid in capital in excess for common stock. Transaction deals with dividends. Remember, dividends are how we share profits back with owners. Those profits come out of retained earnings. There's a couple of dates that are important. One, we when we declare the dividend, and we'll declare that dividend for owners as of a date of record in the future. So whoever owns shares on that future date is going to get the dividend. And then the third date is the date we actually pay it. So in this case here, uh, go ahead and record these entries. Keep in mind that the stock dividend that's uh, listed in transaction three, that the key there is the market value of the share. That determines the amount that we're gonna debit the stock dividend account by. So please go ahead and work on those entries and hit pause and then I'll come back. Okay, the first entry when the board of directors um, declares the dividend, we're going to debit cash dividend, which is a temporary account that exists under retained earnings until it's closed at the end of the year. And we'll do that for the, um, the 50 cents times the 75,000 shares, and we credit cash dividend payable. On the date of record on November 1st, there is no entry made. We just make note of who owns how many shares. On December 1st, when we pay the dividend, we're just paying a current liability. So we debit the current liability and credit cash. Now companies pay stock dividends when they may be short of cash, but still want to reward their shareholders. And stock dividends are basically transferring part of stockholders equity from retained earnings to paid in capital. So we'll debit stock dividend for the fair market value of the shares that we're giving to the shareholders. So we debit stock dividend for $60,000. 
we credit common stock distributable. That's going to be a temporary account under common stock. We credit that for 50,000. It's kind of a placeholder until we actually physically issue the shares. That's done at par. And then we credit paid in capital and excess common stock for the difference. Later then on December 15th, when we actually issue the shares, we debit that placeholder account common stock distributable for par and we credit common stock for par. So when we have par values for stock, whether it's preferred or common stock, we're always going to be crediting common stock or preferred stock for the par value, never more. set of transactions deals with treasury stock and here I'll refresh your memory we use the cost method so we can forget about par that's extraneous information in these problems and we would debit treasury stock for the costs that we paid for it remember treasury stock is a contra account so it has a normal debit balance which offsets the remainder of equity so go ahead and record these three transactions and then hit pause and I'll come back to you shortly. Okay, in the first transaction, we purchased 500 shares of $10 par common stock at $14 per share. And again, the par value is extraneous. So 500 shares times $14 per share. That means that we debit treasury stock for the cost of those shares, $7,000, and we credit cash for that amount because we're paying money to buy our own shares back. The next transaction, we sell some of those treasury stock shares. And so we receive $4,800. Now here's the part that uh, I want you to remember. We'll credit treasury stock for the cost at which we bought those shares. So if we're buying treasury stock at different prices throughout the year and then selling it the next year as an example, we would use some kind of flow assumption like FIFO or something like that to determine which shares we're selling. And then we'll credit paid in capital and excess treasury stock for the difference between what we paid for the shares and what we just sold them for. A company can't earn a, a gain on its income statement or recognize profit in, with regard to selling their own share, buying and selling their own shares. On the August 15th transaction, notice that we're selling the shares at less than what we paid for them. So everything is the same in this transaction. How much cash did we receive? We credit treasury stock for the cost of those shares. And then in this case, we have a debit. A couple of things I want to talk about beyond uh, journal entries in this chapter. So uh, I want to talk, uh, refresh your memory a little bit about classified income statements and classified balance sheets. What the term classified means is that we're going to have more subtotals so that we kind of provide more information for readers of the financial statements. And these could vary by company, of course. A, a service company wouldn't have an income statement that looked like the one in front of you here, uh, but a manufacturing company would as an example, or a merchandiser would. So the first category is revenue. And we record all of the different kinds of revenue accounts under that heading. We'd have cost of goods if it's a manufacturer or cost of merchandise sold if it's a retailer uh, or a wholesaler. And revenue minus cost of goods sold will give us gross profit. The next category will be operating expenses, another word for overhead. And that can be broken down into a variety of categories. Most common is selling expenses and administrative expenses. Generally, selling expenses is going to be everything related to marketing and sales, so sales commissions, all the cost related to salespeople, the cost related to retail stores, all of those kinds of costs would go into selling expenses everything else would go into administrative expenses. So rent, the president's salary, insurance, things like that would go into administrative expenses. That would give us operating income. That tells us how did this business do in terms of the core purpose for which they're in business, okay? Creating products and selling them, that sort of thing. Then we have other income and expenses. Those are items that are extraneous to the core purpose of the business, but still need to be recognized on an income statement. Interest expense is one example. Interest revenue is another example. If I'm a manufacturer and I rent a few acres that I'm not using on my property to another company, that rent is 
included under other income because it's not part of the core purpose for which I'm in business. So we'll include other income and other expenses under or after operating income. And then that gives us the net income line. A classified balance sheet, of course, and different companies are going to have different categories, but here's kind of some basics. So under assets, we would have current assets. Those are assets that are either cash or are going to be turned into cash or consumed within the upcoming 12 month window. We'll have investments and we could have short and long term investments. Those are uh, either uh, investments we've made in stocks or bonds, that sort of thing. But if we have surplus cash, we'll uh, have investments so that we can earn um, income on those. Property, plant and equipment is all of our physical assets and the accumulated appreciation associated with them. And then we have intangibles. That would be patents, um, trademarks, copyrights, those kinds of things, goodwill, uh, less any associated amortization. Under liabilities, we have current liabilities. Those are liabilities that come due within an upcoming 12 month period that we, that we the company intends to pay with current assets. So if it's the intent of the company to replace that current liability with a, another liability, it could be categorized as long term. So long term liabilities are everything that is due after a year or that the company doesn't anticipate using current assets to pay. In stockholders equity, we have paid in capital. That's common stock and com, uh, paid in capital in excess of common stock, preferred stock and it's paid in capital in excess account. We have retained earnings and then treasury stock. The last thing I want to talk about are temporary and permanent accounts. So permanent accounts, uh, you have to kind of get out of your mind. It doesn't mean that they're going to last forever. And, a temp and, and so don't think of it in those terms. Think of it solely as what am I going to close at year end on what's going to carry forward to next year. So permanent accounts will carry forward into the next year. If I have $100,000 of vehicles at the December 31st, I still have those vehicles on January 1st. So that has to carry forward. So permanent accounts are largely balance sheet accounts. Temporary accounts are income statement accounts and dividend accounts which are closed to retain dividend accounts and they're both closed to retain earnings at the end of the year. Meaning if my rent is $1,000 a month, I want to recognize each month of the year, the expense for the month and what it is year to date. But once I reach the end of the year and I see that I've got $12,000 in rent expense for year end, I want to close that to retain earnings to wipe it clean so I can start with the new year. And that's how net income gets into or net losses get into retained earnings is by that closing entry. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to talking to you in the next lecture.